Hi everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me today. I have got a ton of stuff, including the January the 6th committee. What's going to happen with that in the coming weeks? Plus, Josh Hawley is... Putin dead? A lot of people keep asking me that, so I took a look. Also, the relationship between the US and Russia right now. How is that gonna go? Plus, this painting, which is apparently cursed, the crying boy. Plus, a whole load more. Welcome to the new subscribers. It's lovely to see you. Uh, thank you to the donors. Always appreciated. Uh, both your contributions and your kind words. Very, very grateful. Thank you. And also a big thank you to the commenters. Really, really interesting as always, including the person who said that the Italy pictures were absolutely true. That's good to hear. Thank you for that. And I was going to mention, talking about things that are true, the funny girl pictures. You know, the Broadway show. I've mentioned it once before saying the pictures had come true, but now they've come really true. <laughs> because if you remember, it didn't open very well. The critics didn't appreciate it. It was snubbed at the Tony Awards. The lead actress, Beanie Feldstein, wasn't considered up to the job. And although she was supposed to stay in the role for quite a while, she decided that she was going to leave in September. So if you remember the pictures there, was that submersible underwater? It came to the surface, but it was listing and in shadow and heading for rocks. And if they didn't do something drastically to save it then the submersible would capsize and sink, meaning the show would as well. Well, it turns out that now Beanie Feldstein is leaving even earlier, in July. Probably because the woman who should have been cast in it in the first place, Leah Michelle, has now finally got the role, which is her dream role of a lifetime. So now the submersible and the show should sail into sunlight and be rescued. Why this is interesting right now is because while I was researching Leah Michelle and Funny Girl, her boyfriend from Glee, Corey Monteith, kept coming up in videos on YouTube. I don't know if you know anything about him, but he died at the age of 31 of a heroin and alcohol overdose. That combo proved lethal for him. He'd had drug problems before, though, starting when he was 13. He was in rehab by the age of 19. And I think during season four of Glee, the rest of the cast and the producers had to have an intervention and pack him off to rehab again. That was in March of 2013. Then in July of 2013, in a hotel in Vancouver, he drank two bottles of champagne, free-based heroin, and died. The coroner said that it was an accidental death. But there was something about the repetitive nature of these videos coming up on YouTube that called out to me, and I thought, I wonder if I should do his transition pictures. So I did, and they did turn up a couple of really interesting things. When I found him, he was walking down a path of very, very jagged little rocks in soft shoes. This was before he died, I'm assuming. It was very uncomfortable on his feet. He must have been going through a rough time internally because this was sore, this was difficult. Before long, he came to the entrance to a little tunnel and thought, huh, this looks familiar. I wonder what's in here. And he goes inside and it continues on down. And it's fine because he can still see daylight behind him. He's okay. He'll come back. Then it turns around a corner and he can't see the light anymore behind him. But that doesn't matter. He's fine. It's not far away. He can still keep exploring. And he does. He walks on down until eventually he is at the entrance to that metaphorical cave I always see when I do transition pictures. And now he begins to feel trouble because he can't see the light behind him and he's in this strange place he's never been to before. So he thinks, oh, I'll go back. But he can't go back. The light has gone out. As he's looking around this space, he sticks his hands in his back pocket, I mean, metaphorically, sticks his hands in his back pockets and goes, uh, what do I do now? Uh, anybody know? Of course, there's no reply. There's nobody there. 
he becomes slightly agitated, even a little depressed by his choices. But of course, there's a current. So you have to keep on moving. And he feels himself being drawn up this symbolic tunnel that I always see. Only it's not a clear run through for him. Halfway up, there is a blockage with a door in it. And it's almost as if there's a voice at this point says to him, Are you ready? Do you want to go forward? To which he would reply, Of course I don't want to go forward. I don't want this. And the voice goes, Well, you chose it. Because I didn't choose it. I just fell into it. And the voice would say, You choose even when you don't choose. This is the product of all your choices, unwise and wise. We choose even when we don't choose. We must take the consequences of our actions. And he didn't want to take these particular consequences. He said, I want to go back. I want to unchoose. You can't unchoose. There was a movie shown on TV recently, CODA. It stands for Child of Deaf Adults. I'll put the link to a song in it in the show notes below this video because it's uh, the song Both Sides Now by Joni Mitchell, who is Canadian, like Cory Monteith. And this is a particularly beautiful rendition in the movie of the song. And although I must have heard it a thousand times in my life, only now did certain lyrics really stand out to me. One of which was the one about clouds. Now they only block the sun. They rain and snow on everyone. So many things I would have done. But clouds got in my way. Clouds of fear, regret, shame, self-doubt. Ego clouds. That get in the way of our living our full soul's purpose. Which is what applied to Cory Monteith. And when he went through the door and he saw the light ahead of him and knew this was final, he broke down and wept. He began to realize how the clouds had got in his way. And if he had been able to speak at this point, it was more like, I don't want to go. And the voice would have said, come with us. We'll untangle it later. And he would step into the light and go. But there was a feeling here of having so many options in life, so much to accomplish, and yet having made choices or abstained from making certain choices out of pain, uh, out of inner problems that he was unable to resolve, whatever it was, that had led him to this point. And yes, it was an accident in a way, because he really was just exploring how deep he could go before it was too late. And this time, he found out. Okay, so let's crack on with Josh Hawley, hashtag laughing stock. <laughs> you do wonder whether at some point in the past, the GOP went around America trying to recruit candidates who were so firmly entrenched in their tribal script that they wouldn't yield for a second, not even for the benefit of their constituents or for America or for anything. They just wanted what they wanted and would say no to everything else. And of course, Josh Hawley is only relevant now because he came up in the January the 6th hearing. He was seen fleeing through the Capitol building, despite the fact that earlier on he'd fist-pumped the crowd, egging them on, I assume, to insurrection. Something he's very proud of, by the way. It's on his merchandise on his website, that fist-pump. So he doesn't regret it for a second. But I thought I'd take another look at him to see how things might have changed in light of the January the 6th hearing. And when I found him, he was on one of those moving walkways that I very often see, which means that the person is heading in one particular direction and being carried by consequences towards a particular future. 
He, though, was stuck, not only because it was moving in a particular direction, but because he was coated in what seemed like plaster of Paris, made him into a statue. He couldn't change now if he wanted to. His posture was fixed. We all knew what was going on with Josh Hawley. So the inevitability that went with being on this walkway was underscored by a complete inability now to undo what he'd done. He was stuck in plaster of Paris. In fact, at one point, there was a road off. And he goes, I want to go there. That's where I'm supposed to be going. But hey, you can't go anywhere when you're a plaster of Paris statue. He was glued to the spot. And the walkway continued. And he began to feel panicky. Don't be fooled by his bravado, by his powerful words of defiance. This guy is terrified of where this is leading. But of course, you know, he's a statue. He's inside it. People are looking at the front. They're looking at the mask. They're not seeing what's really going on inside him. Except that the walkway started getting bumpy. It was going over gravel. So instead of being allowed to just stand there, he was being jolted around. (laughs) This in turn caused the plaster of Paris to start cracking and bits began dropping off, exposing him for who he really was. My theory is that Josh Hawley appeared in the hearing the other day because later on down the line, Something else is going to be revealed about him. That was just a seed that they planted early on so that they could bring it back later. And sure enough, he was exposed for who and what he was further down the road. And he fell to his knees like, oh God, I wish I'd never done this. Why did I allow myself to take part in this? Oh my Lord. Usually it's when you're brought to your knees that you learn the biggest lessons of your life. And so maybe Josh Hawley learns humility, maybe, or honesty. Or what happens when you have to take responsibility for the consequences of your actions. That's what it felt like. Now, here's an interesting thing. Last week in Los Angeles, California, that's on the west coast of America, you know. There was a jewelry heist. Value $100 million of jewelry stolen. And in the most bizarre circumstances, two drivers were taking this truck of jewelry to Pasadena for a show, I think. But they needed a pee, they needed a snack, so they stopped off at a cafe. And while they were in the cafe, a gang comes along and steals the entire contents of the truck. (laughs) And I don't think there was adequate insurance on this jewellery, but they took roughly a hundred million dollars worth. So I thought it'd be kind of fun slash interesting to see if I could do pictures for a jewel heist. When I went into the energy, there was the truck, it had no wheels, there was the truck with one guy sitting on top. And as I watched a large pair of legs came over and stood on the edge of its shoes. You know the way little children do? They stand on the edge of their shoes and encased the truck in their shoes, causing a giant shadow to fall over it. Judging by the size of the person and the shoes, this was a very, very well-organized operation. It wasn't just some loner wandering across a parking lot thinking, I'm going to steal that truck. I wonder what's in it. No, this was a big deal. And when I went under the shoes, it was very dark. So there was anxiety. There was worry. Will this go right? Oh my God, what if we're caught? That kind of thing. It came out the other side into, it wasn't a tunnel. It was like one of those bridges that you cross at airports between terminals. You know, they have glass roofs and stuff. And you walk across them. It was like that. At the end was a flight of steps, still in darkness, so lots more worry, lots more pressure, anxiety. And at the bottom of there was, it looked like a warehouse or a hangar or something, with two exits. Now, the one ahead led out onto 
And unfortunately, this is a little on the nose, it was tarmac, as though they were at an airport and there were lots of little planes around and so on. The other exit led to the same place, actually, but there was a little tunnel to go through, and this was full of anxiety and worry. Maybe there was an 11th hour hitch, and they had to dodge around. But once they came out of the tunnel, they were on the same airfield. So it doesn't mean there was an airfield. But if there was, then that would make total sense. But I don't know. It's a little bit on the nose there. But it felt, in terms of how they were emotionally responding to the series of events that happened, there were periods of great anxiety, followed by coasting and relief, then more anxiety and more activity. It was a huge operation in its way. Even if there are only four people involved, <laughs> it was a huge operation. And uh, I don't think there were only four people involved. But anyway, uh, that's what happened. That was the jewelry heist. I have no idea if that's right, but that's what the pictures were. Now, somebody asked, because I've been doing energy for artwork and stuff, would I do pictures for this painting? The Crying Boy by a guy called Giovanni Bragolin, who was supposedly Italian because he painted in Venice, but no, he was really Spanish. And his real name was Bruno Amadio. He also had a French name, though. <laughs> but he produced dozens of these crying child pictures for tourists. It's how he made his money. And nobody probably would ever have heard of them, except that there was a curse attached to this picture. What happened was that a bunch of them were found in a burnt out house by firefighters and they were untouched by the flames. And people thought, oh, wow, what does that mean? Well, it actually means that they were coated in fire retardant and so they didn't burn. There was nothing about it at all. But you know what people are like, they fall for anything. And so a bit of a reputation built up around them, more so when Amadio's studio and apartment burnt down as well. There were lots of fires connected to these pictures, and so people thought there must be a curse. There's not, but people thought it. So somebody said, will you please look at this picture and see what you get from it? Well, when I went into the energy, there was some kind of padding or cushioning behind the frame, and I did begin to wonder whether that wasn't the emotion inherent in the picture which is why so many people over the years have bought it and hung it on their wall. It's a very, very popular print even now. When I went up to the padding, though, it split open and out poured a stream of tiny little balls all over the floor in a heap. I went over to touch them and immediately they got stuck to my hands. I couldn't get them off, like, uh, 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 get off, uh. This was unshakable hurt, unshakable fear, anxiety, whatever it might be. And that's what appealed to people who bought this painting. So you could almost go up to anybody who owned one and say, okay, what worries, what pain are you playing on a loop in your head? that you can't shed? What clouds are blocking out the sun for you? And isn't it about time you let them go? It's almost like this painting, when it's hung in someone's home, is at a deep unconscious level, a cry for help to anybody who comes to the house and sees it. Listen to me. Let me tell you my story. They can't do it themselves, so they hang this painting with its cloying balls, its emotional stuff that you can't get off. And it says, please pay attention to my wounds. That's what it felt like. Now, I've been asked yet again to do pictures for South Africa. I've done it so many times. And it's like everywhere else in the world, it's going through a period of great disruption, like Sri Lanka and Brazil and Ukraine and Russia. There's lots of stuff going on because the world is in a process of switching from one era to another, and it's not easy 
to change. But uh, in South Africa, they have massive problems. They've got uh, youth unemployment. It's very, very high. They've got crime, corruption. There were riots last year after the previous president was arrested for contempt of court and then they had COVID and monkeypox or whatever. It's not been easy. And somebody said, will you please take another look at South Africa? Well, I didn't have time to do a huge amount of pictures for this, but I did a quick jotting this morning. And when I went into the energy of South Africa right now, there was a mango. <laughs> Just go with it. There was a mango. And you know, mangoes have thick skin on the outside, and then beautiful, soft fruit on the inside. And as I watched the outer skin, the thick skin, peel back, and inside was the fleshy fruit, and out popped the real South Africa, the joyful South Africa, the kind of South Africa that people actually want, but don't have right now. And this figure fell through the clouds. Everything's about clouds right now. It fell through the clouds and landed on the ground. This was everyday reality. Enough mango fantasies. This was what was happening at the moment. And directly ahead of it was what looked to me like a dust storm. Ferocious. Full of turmoil and turbulence bringing to the surface all the things that needed changing. The trouble is if you dwell on those things that need changing and you keep complaining about them, you give them energy and you draw into your experience circumstances of a similar vibration. So you get more turmoil, more youth unemployment, more crime, more corruption. It is a very, very difficult situation. And I went into the cloud to see what was happening, and it was hellish. It was really difficult once you were in the cloud to see the goodness of the world, the possibilities and beauty of South Africa, because this system, this turbulence, this corruption, was destroying everybody who wandered into it. And yet... Eventually, slowly, 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 it moved off. The storm started to blow itself out, leaving South Africa, the real South Africa, the beautiful, happy, wonderful South Africa, sitting there watching it go with massive amounts of relief. This could take quite a time. Because the ideal, which is the mango above the clouds, the ideal is there. People understand what they want from their country that would make life amazing and perfect for them. But this dust storm, like in so many other parts of the world, was throwing up all the things that were wrong with the country so that they could be examined, scrutinized, resolved, and the dust cloud could move on. That's what that was like. Somebody said, will you please take a look at the relationship currently between Russia and the United States? Because although Russia is putting on a brave face about everything being fine and it's going to conquer Ukraine and it's going to take other countries as well and watch out for nuclear war because we might start that, there's lots of stuff going on. They do seem relatively weak and getting weaker by virtue of the fact that they are the pariah of the world right now and uh, the rest of the world is set against them almost. So I thought, okay, well, let's take a look and see how the relations are going between the US and uh, Russia. And when I went into the energy, Russia was shaky as if it had Parkinson's. And America, standing there rather confidently in the background with its arms folded, went, are you okay? Do you need any help? Russia went, no, I'm absolutely fine. Don't worry about me. I'm doing great. Well, you don't look like you're doing great. Stop fussing. I'm fine. Wobble, 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 wobble. Away it went. It was liquefying before my eyes. And once again, America said, look, it doesn't have to be this way. If you could see reason, we can step in and help you. We have a bucket. We could carry you to a table and put you back together again. Come on. All America could do was wait it out. 
until Russia saw reason. And I wondered whether that was tied in with when Putin dies, if Putin dies. And people have been saying, oh, he's dead already. He's gone. They're just using body doubles now. In Iran, apparently, they used a body double, which Putin does sometimes, although the one in Iran was almost identical, if that was a body double. But I thought, okay, let's see if I can do transition pictures for him. I couldn't. That doesn't mean he's not dead, but I couldn't get anything in terms of crossing over. So I went into the general energy of Vladimir Putin. And when I did, he was standing at the top of a slope. There was a wall behind him suggesting he was below par. He wasn't on top of the wall, which he would have been if he'd been fine, I think. Trouble is, his shoes were made of metal. And there was a current. Only this one was actually magnetic. And it was pulling at his shoes. He was desperate not to go down this slope. He hung onto the wall as the current, the magnetic pull, tried to drag his shoes away from him. In the end, he didn't have the energy, the power to resist the pull. And it dragged him off the wall and down the slope where he faced a big rectangular tunnel. Remember that enormous hallway he walked down in previous pictures, the one lined with portraits? And at some point he came to a rectangular pit filled with black, jello -y type stuff. And he looked in it and went, oh no, not now, not here. Maybe this rectangular tunnel entrance represents his demise. If he is alive and the picture suggests that he is, then he is facing some kind of decline. A decline he is resisting like mad. He doesn't want to go. But the pull, there is a pull in life towards the end. Death will win. It's just a matter of how long it takes for Vladimir Putin. And finally, I took a look at the January the 6th committee. Now, of course, I've done their pictures before, but the previous ones have now run out. That was the one with the blanket on the hillside and all the people, thousands of them, looking up at it going, oh my God. Well, that's actually what happened with the hearings, of course. So now I thought I'd look ahead and see what might happen over the coming few weeks. It's due to reconvene, as far as public hearings goes, in September. Because so much information has come in that phase one had to stop so that it could collate all the new information and then present phase two. But it's incredibly close to the midterms and that's very worrying for a lot of people. When I went into the energy of the committee, there it is. It was stretching as though it was doing exercises, really pushing itself to cover a lot of ground. Oh, first one leg, then oh, another big stride. I think we underestimate, and maybe they underestimate, how much work there is here and how deep this goes as far as the insurrection goes. It just seemed like a bunch of people fighting on the steps of the Capitol building. This may stretch out way beyond that, and that's what they're doing right now. They're collating all that information. Well, it did these exercises for a little while, taking it along a path. Then it started to wander from the path, which was a little concerning. And there was a lake, a small lake of tar, something like that. It was black, it was oily, it was gooey. Maybe the evidence is so damning and there's so much of it and it takes them into such treacherous terrain that there's a danger they could get bogged down in the very thing they're trying to show. Because if they wandered too far off, then they were going to lose their way. In the end, they kind of realized this, I think, and they waded through this mire of tar back to the road. 
and carried on. And there was a little hill, which I assumed to be the midterms because the midterms are usually shown as a little hill. Then the path went left or it went right, but not forward. This is their deadline. After the midterms, it's very likely that Liz Cheney will lose her seat. Adam Kinzinger is losing his seat. He's giving up. And so everything will change come January. That's their deadline. And the issue is, will they get so distracted by what goes on over the next few weeks, whether it's in terms of evidence or what goes on in society or tricks that the GOP poll? It's very hard to know what this is. But will they get so sidetracked by that that they lose their way? If they can stay on track, or if they wander off track, get back on track, then they will come to a definitive moment where they go, okay, that's that done. And now we take a new direction. We either continue looking and go on in that way, or we go, no, we're done, and now it's in the hands of the DOJ. But it does seem that by the time the midterms have happened, and I'm putting it at January because that's when the new people are sworn in, they have to have finalized a good portion of what they're doing. Because big decisions will have to be made about how they're going to take it in future. That's what it felt like. All right, thank you so much for watching. I was told not to speed up because people really do watch to the end, but I'm not taking any chances. (laughs) Subscribe, share, like if you would, that'd be great. (laughs) Follow me on Twitter, at Cash Peters. If you really want to, follow Olive, at Olive Meets World. Just the cutest. She loves that camera. That's Olive Meets World on Twitter. Otherwise, I will see you next time, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.